Hi, I'm Brandon Brown. I'm the transition expert with Lifecycle Transitions. Uh, today's guest is going to be Vanessa. Vanessa's going through a number of challenges with her aging aunt who's been living in her home since 1902. Uh, in this time frame, she's uh, decided to go into an assisted living, and now there's a lot of choices and decisions that need to be made with the home. I hope today you learn a lot about how to make those decisions, why those decisions are going to be made, but also how to make your decision a lot easier than it is for, for Vanessa. Vanessa, welcome. Hi, Brandon, and thank you for having me on. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about the, uh, your situation with your aunt? So I currently live in California. My aunt is in uh, the Boston area, and she has lived in the same house since 1967. She is uh, actually 92, and a couple weeks ago, I did bring her to assisted living, um, and it, it's been you know, not only a personal struggle and a challenge for her because she's been independent and unfortunately, you know, as we age, so does in our body. So uh, again, this has been really kind of a life altering situation for her. And, and like I said, also for me too, and the challenges of, like I said, not only being 3000 miles away, uh, but also, you know, engaging with take, not taking away someone's independence, but um, you know, it's a challenge of losing your independence. Right. How, how, how did you hear about Life Cycle, by the way? So you came as a, a, an incredible referral from uh, Jackie, who has been working with my aunt to uh, help her kind of clear out some things and, um, you know, whether it's having things taken, you know, to goodwill or just kind of like a downsizing her house, more or less, for the last few years. Now, when you were now, I've been in a space for over 12 years and working with, you know, elderly clients, particularly your mom, your dad <clears throat> or any loved one. It's, it's very it's very tedious. And usually it's not something that happens overnight. How long would you say did you notice how long has it been that you've noticed that there was something wrong with her living situation and something needed to change? So it's been progressional. Like, I, I, again, I mean, she is a very strong 92 year old um and nothing gets by her and and unfortunately um like i said as her as she aged so didn't you know parts of her body like her knees and the struggle of getting up and down the stairs so i would have to say it's probably been maybe the last 12 years that we've worked in stages so uh about 12 somewhere around 12 years ago i had had her move her bedroom down to kind of like the main floor uh -huh. um, so it just made it more convenient than <clears throat> having to climb three sets of stairs. Um, again, it's an old brownstone. So even the challenges of getting up and down where the kitchen is in the, the what we, I guess you consider like the basement floor. Right. Um, but at least this only gave her one flight of stairs to, you know, to go up and down. And then, like I said, the challenges of falling. Um, uh, like I said, she's a very strong uh woman, she unfortunately, probably about five or six years ago, uh, in the wintertime had fallen and broken her leg. And so that was the first time she really kind of was in rehab. And, you know, my suggestion of maybe our living situation needs to be um, considered something different. And again, I mean, she, like I said, she was very strong willed in making sure that she was back and in independent again. And uh, she had literally taken assisted living off the table. So it, it's like I said, it's been a progression. So in in her case, what does she have any other kids? Because I, I noticed, you know, you you mentioned you speak very highly of your aunt, but does she have any children or any other close relatives other than you? My dad. I mean, I, my dad lives still in the Boston area, but he, I mean, he's 88. And my sister uh, is in Dallas. And, you know, I again, I don't have children. So it, it's and neither does my aunt. So I think it just kind of naturally fell you know, to me is being a caretaker. How long has your aunt lived in the home? Uh, since 1967. Now, there, I understand from talking with you before, there's a, a, a rich history uh, in this home. Can you share with us about, you know, what it was like for your, your aunt to live in this area, this home in the, from the 60s, the 70s, up until now? All right. Well, uh, both my dad and my aunt grew up in uh, the Dorchester area, Blue Hill Ave. And, um, I guess kind of the story went that my grandfather and my great uncle uh, had bought this brownstone for their parents somewhere around 1902. 
Uh, so it really has been in our family for a very long time. And I guess even prior to, to them buying it, it actually, they had rented it. And then I guess from my understanding that my grandfather and his brother had uh, then purchased it, purchased it. So my uncle or great uncle Pete had um, then remained in the home. And when he was transitioning out, um, basically sold it to my aunt for a dollar. So it, it's been in the family, like I said, for, uh, gosh, now what, uh, 122 years if I can do my math correctly so it's been like I said and she's been there since uh, 1967. Now getting her to decide to come out of the home what was was there something that happened was there a straw that broke the camel's back did she did she get injured or fall in the home? Well I, as I said she um, fell and broke her leg five or six years ago um, and you know worked very hard to get back into shape to move back home and then uh Probably a year or so ago, she had uh, fallen and broken her arm. And she also, when she fell, um, hit her, her left eye. And now she's basically blind in her left eye. So, Is it due to the injury or was it yeah. something? You so know, I think this is <clears throat> too, because I have been consistently saying since she broke her leg that, you know, we really need to think about alternative um places to live and, you know, my concern about her falling. And, you know, uh, like I said, she is very much on her own health care and her paying her own bills. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, she's extremely independent. And uh, like I said, I, I think it was just more so the aging process in not recognizing the fact that, you know, we're living in a, a kind of a dangerous situation at this point. Now, the, the interesting thing is that falls represents, uh, you know, 4 million fatalities a year. Um, in fact, it's the most dangerous thing of living independently in a home for an elderly client is to fall, which is why we have life alerts and all these different uh, tools to in order to keep track of you know, our, our loved ones in the event that they're living independently. And to add injury or possibility to injury to that is to live in a four-floor wa walk-up. I mean, a four-level walk-up. I mean, how how daring is that for her to take that take that journey on? Oh, it was. And that was my concern because no matter, even if I had her, what I should, like I said, about 10, 12 years ago, I had her move her bedroom down to the first floor, I mean, to the main floor, but it still didn't um, give her access directly to the kitchen. So she still had another flight of stairs. So it, it really, it, like I said, it really is a struggle. Um, again, where she is of sound mind that I really didn't have any right to come in and say, this is not okay anymore. Um, and I think that it was to the point where she had to recognize that, you know, that this wasn't an ideal living situation for her anymore. Now, <clears throat> for, for the people who are listening in, the, the kitchen is on the first level of the four level uh, single family. Which, yeah, which would technically actually be the basement. So you would technically be the, the basement. Yeah. Now, you walk to the main floor is, of where she had put her, where I had uh, her move her bedroom down to, and then she had a living room, but yet there was no way to be able to move the uh, kitchen to make it, you know, a, a one a garden style, I guess, if you want to call it living space. Now, that brings me to my next question. Now, from a construction standpoint or a structural layout, if you will, having the, the kitchen in the basement makes a lot of sense from being able to occupy the this, this space in an area where square footage is in high demand. Um, I understood why that was there because, you know, it doesn't fall under certain guidelines where you it's not a livable space, you know, for like a bedroom or, you know, so forth, for like a bedroom that needs to have an egress or needs to have a closet or something to be considered what it is. You get more square footage by having it down there. But was that an act of necessity for her to do that intentionally? And did that happen 30 years ago, 40 years ago? Or was it like that in 1902? You know, to the I mean, in my lifetime, I've always remembered it being uh, in the basement. So I, I think a little bit of the history, and again, a lot of those older homes that you had, you know, multiple multiple generations living under one roof. So I do think that there was somehow another kitchen, maybe on the second, the, yeah, the second uh, floor. So I, I'm not exactly too sure of the history, but I know that the kit there was almost two kitchens um, at one point. Mm -hmm. And then, um, again, when she had moved in, I think that 
then those became bedrooms and then the kitchen became um like i said basically technically in the in the basement which it has a walkout so it's not like you know a boston style i mean it's a beautiful kitchen no i mean the, the house is beautiful i mean it has a lot of charm a lot of charisma um one of the things that i was trying to get my head on was trying to figure out how to to make use of the home i mean cuz right now um you're currently using the house to to sell to to rent out rooms, correct? Well, she always has. She's always had either uh, you know medical students of some sort um, because of the Longwood area and where she lives. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, currently she has, I, I believe, two uh, doctors that are. I know at least one's from Harvard. I'm not exactly too sure where the uh, other gentleman's from. Uh, so she's always had you know um, residents living there, even and mostly from other countries too, which is really kind of cool. I mean, they're so. What's what's it like to to work with your aunt? I mean, when they're older, you know, there's two scenarios that you're you're dealt with. You're dealt with one that isn't making all the most cognitive decisions. They're not making the right choices. They they tend to think irrationally and behave irrationally, maybe because of dementia or any other underlying issues that they're dealing with. And then there's the ones who are incredibly sharp. They know exactly what they want to do, when they want to do it, and how they want to do it, but they may not necessarily be realistic in what they're trying to accomplish. Which of those two scenarios do you think your aunt is falling in? Oh, definitely the second. I mean, she, like I said, that they, it, it has nothing to do with her cognitive ability. It, it more had to do with or has to do now with the physical part. Um, again, like I said, she's been... So, I mean, I, I can tell you a couple of funny stories. I mean, she actually will text. She emails. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, she's, I wouldn't say she's 92 technically savvy, but I mean, I give anybody a lot of credit at that age that, and also not only at that age, but she basically has one working eye. So I kind of have to bust out laughing when I'll get a text from her. So even though it, it you know, you have to kind of figure out what she's typing or, or what have you, but, um, you know, she is extremely independent and will take on certain challenges that I think that most people wouldn't. So, um, which also poses the other side too, that, you know, as I considered, you know, her living situation not to be safe anymore uh, and she's independent. And I, like I said, I had no legal right to step in and, and say, okay, this is no longer okay. Um, but I, communication, I will tell you, is one of the other things too, you know, that, um, again, I also live 3000 miles away, but you know, she's so, used to handling her own affairs that um, now as I transition to taking over, you know, it, it's been hard for her to, to not be in control, which I completely understand. Right. I mean, I, I work with quite a few clients that are no longer living in the home and they're making decisions uh, away from the home, you know, basically whether they're in assisted living, independent living, or even hospitalized. And they feel that they're not in control of what decisions are being made. And they feel that the family members aren't respecting their wishes. They're talking down to them. Uh, they're talking to them like they're kids. And, and, and that really infuriates them. And it makes the whole entire process that much more difficult. Um, I like the fact that you sound like you're really welcoming your mom, your aunt's kind of dialogue or opinion into a dialogue that you can come up to a conclusion that's reasonable. However, you do know that some of the things that she's coming up with aren't necessarily the right direction to, to take on. Um, right now, this moment, this second, what is the challenge with this, with your taking on, on the responsibility? What are you, what are you struggling with? I, I, it's repairs. I mean, you know, the house is 1800, you know, built in the 1800s. And unfortunately, I would have to say uh, the last, I don't know. 15, 20 years, probably there's certain things that have gone unrecognized. Right. And now, um, again, as you and I have talked, the challenges of, of getting even uh, a brownstone of that size, but also the proximity of getting trucks in and out and, you know, people wanting to, you know, do the work on that. Um, also, you know, kind of on a personal note too, the person that was supposed to be the handyman, um, you know, she couldn't get up to the top two floors. And so some things that were being told that were being done absolutely were not. Mm -hmm. And I, like I said, I, I it, it's really hard for me and it, it will be dealt with, but it's really hard for me to understand, you know, someone who has been, 
you know, assisting her this many years. And then I, my opinion has taken full advantage of, you know, her lack of capacity to, you know, uh, see the, the things that were supposedly or allegedly being done. Okay. So right now, if we were to summarize everything right now, <clears throat> one of the things that I wanted to do with you is I wanted to, we wanted to streamline a directive, a decision, figuring out what, what path we're going to go. Are we going to go option A? Are we going to go option B or option C? And put it all on the table and analyze the, the, the direction that's going to be the most fruitful for the family financially, mentally, and emotionally. Um, option A is your aunt didn't want to leave. We all are aware that she didn't want to leave. And at some point she left because it was at that point where you said, look, enough's enough, right? Well, and we both did. I mean, she, I think she, again, she had to get to the point where she knew that it was no longer, and I don't, no longer, um, feasible there. Well, I think it had more to do with safety. And again, with COVID, I think she was also, you know, isolated. I mean, she was playing bridge once a week and uh, goes to the museum and out to dinner and, you know, and then the world shuts down. So I think the challenge of not only, um, you know, her age and her lack of physical ability, but I also think that COVID played a huge part in just even her, her mental status, you know, which, like I said, has affected the majority of us as well. Um, so I think that there were a, a lot of different pieces that kind of allowed her to make the the final decision that okay I, I it's time to it's time to think about assisted living and, and living somewhere else where you know I don't have to make my own meals I don't have to you know rely on other people I okay. mean or I'm able to rely on other people now so no one believes you kicked her out of the house I I, I don't think that you forced well, the decision if anything it was I was, mutual I, if anything I was so afraid that elder services was going to call me and say how have you allowed this situation to happen? Uh, yeah. And uh, like I said, I, it's, you know, and then when you meet her, you understand like, okay, I understand how you couldn't put your foot down. I mean, again, she is fully cognitive to make her own decisions. And uh, again, I, this hasn't been a, a new conversation for us. Um, uh -huh. I think her last fall really kind of put things into place. Um, again, when we were kind of talking about the assisted living, it went from, okay, I, I agree. And then it was, well, maybe April. Well, next time I talked to her, maybe it was May. And then it was June. And I said, oh, no, 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 I'm flying in. We're going March 1st, you know? So okay. that was really the the most that I've had to put my foot down. Um, uh -huh. but again, I think she finally got to the point where she just knew it was time to kind of surrender and, and go to the next phase. Well, that process is a very difficult process for a lot of people to, to endure. Um, the idea of making a decision is so easy to be put off. There's there's loads of procrastination involved. We'll do it next week. We'll do it next year. We'll do it here. It often only happens when something happens. And it usually results in an unfortunate fall or an unfortunate visit in a hospital or a skilled nursing home that now they realize returning back to the unsafe environment is what led them down that passage that they don't want to go back to. Um, in this case, it didn't sound like you were making that decision from a hospital, but you were making that decision and she made the decision and you're like, okay, great. You made it now. Let's do it. Um, let's look at the options again. So option A is she's already in the assisted living. Option B at this point is what to do with the home. And that option was, should we renovate it? Should we fix it up? Should we turn it into... Uh, an Airbnb, or should we keep it as, you know, uh, rooms that she's done for many years? Or option three, should we possibly sell the home? Now, I know option three is a difficult decision for you to make. And I think I know why. And I think it has something to do with 1902. This home being in the family for a number of years, how does it make you feel feeling like you're the one that's going to make that final decision? I, I mean, I think it's it's kind of a legacy challenge too. I mean, she's been at on Wigglesworth Street for, like I said, for, since 1967, and prior to that, it was, you know, um, my great grandparents and my great uncle since 1902. So, uh, so I, I think the hard part about it is that ultimately it's her decision, and she has been, you know, very outspoken about the fact that she doesn't want the house to be sold. 
Um, and like I said, I can, I am respectful of, you know, her decision and will try to do, you know, what I can to, to make that happen. I think that, like I said, it, it's now trying to find out, you know, is it financially feasible? And, and again, I would throw this out there too, is that, you know, when people of her age, she was born in 1933, when, it, you know, at their age, you think that social security is going to carry you financially and you work hard your whole entire life. And then now people are living longer and social security has not kind of met up to the cost of living to where we are today. And right. so, you know, there's financial challenges as well. And assisted living is, you know, is, is not affordable. And well, not to not to interject or whatever, but I wanted to piggyback on what you just mentioned. A lot of us we 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 sort of joke around with our elderly loved ones about being so frugal, and we tell them that you know you you, you can't things don't cost that way or this they, you know you can't be like that with money or you should invest in that new sofa that new couch. But a lot of times they kind of get an idea of something that maybe we don't understand, and and that's the fact that the cost of things are going to go up. And they're worried that they're not going to have enough money in order to su- survive and sustain the way that they want to they live. And in a case like this, where she worked her entire life as a professional, she saved, she lived a very modest life. It didn't sound like she was living well beyond her means. Um, you would think that she would have enough with Social Security, with her savings to be able to live and sustain in the home. Unfortunately, I don't think she expected the house to be worth what it is today. <laughs> and I think that taxes, the taxes on that that real estate isn't really a fair representation of what the house really is from how she's kept up with over the years. Would you agree? No, I agree. And like I said, I mean, you can plan as much, but I mean, again, you look at the housing crisis and things have, you know, ebbed and flowed and, you know, you, you could have sold them, you could, you know, and again, you're right. I mean, there is a huge tax um, issue for selling. Um, there's, again, it's, Right now, it's it's trying to figure out that balance of respecting her wishes of not selling the house, but yet financially being able to support, you know, uh, where she's living now. And like I said, it's it's a lot of money. Right. So where we are at this point is we we've, we've sent one of our our team. We sent the number of our team members to the property uh, with LifeCycle to assess the structural issues. Uh, Wait a minute. Is this have- where you're going to drop the bomb on me? No, we're not going to do that now. We sent the team there. We're still we're still in the discovery stage at this point. Uh, we have uh, we have engineers looking at the property. We have uh, carpenters. We have masonry. We have masons, uh, as well as uh, roofers looking at the property to to get an idea as to what the full scope and measure is involved in order to get this place turned around. Uh, at this point, more than any, it's important not to throw good money at bad money. And if we don't make the right decision. Uh, you're going to find yourself you know, regretting it later. So we, we wanted to give you all the information you need to have in order to make an informed decision. Um, because I do believe, you know, having that information at this point is going to help you be able to decide, right? Right. And, and again, this is not just solely my decision too, you know? So yes, obviously the more educated I am based on, you know, uh, all the facts that I can, you know, put together and then being able to, you know, work through the details on, you know, is this fiscally responsible to do this, this, or this? Right. So absolutely. Now, financially, at one point you mentioned that you, you were going to be the main uh, contributor financially in getting this project off the ground. If you guys decided to invest in doing uh, the rebuild, is that still the case or have you guys talked differently about the, the direction? Well, again, and this is all based upon, you know, what the the, the cost is, you know, um, again, I mean, it's not like I can, I, I personally can't just write a check for, you know, whatever, a couple hundred grand or whatever. I, I don't know exactly what we're looking at. So it's kind uh-huh. of, you know, it's kind of hard for me to say, um, you know, where I would be at. But mm-hmm. again, this is, I think the challenge is that, you know, it's not an endless bankroll that either one of us could tap into, you know, for resources. So it's, again, at her age and lack of income, mm-hmm. she can't get a home equity loan. She can't refinance on her house. Um, so all those things that maybe you and I can do at our age and our income level um, now propose, you know, have a different uh, challenge, financial challenge. Right. What do, what do you 
what are you, what are the options for you at this point in this case at, at the point we're at right now what are your options again and I, I don't know that I can give it a qualified answer or decision because I, like I said I, I don't know I don't know if this is going to be a five thousand dollar job or a two hundred fifty thousand dollar job so this well, is no. where well, not in terms of the construction, but I'm saying, what are your options overall as it pertains to what you're going to do with your aunt and what you're going to do with the family's home? Um, you know, the the scope can change from A to Z, but the definitive direction at this point needs to be, um, I guess, in your case, you know, are you going to continue to leave things the way that they are until, you know, unfortunately, your aunt passes away someday and then make decisions afterwards, which is a choice that I've seen a lot of clients make um, because they just don't want to upset the apple cart. And then option two is they decide, look, we, we need to stop the hemorrhaging. We need to stop the, the 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 loss of revenue. Because one thing I did know is that your aunt's not getting fair market value for what the house is worth in that area. Um, and just continuing down that path is, you know, is a financial nightmare from a standpoint of doing the financial resp financially responsible thing, which is to maximize your profitability in any situation, specifically in a situation where you decide to be a landlord and you're renting rooms or you're renting space. Uh, it's a very desirable area. There's a lot of people interested in that area and it would really serve the estate well to make sure that you're, you're doing it the right way to make sure that that revenue is going to the estate appropriately. Uh, the second thing is, you know, is if you're going to go into the Airbnb space, which is one of the options I think you've mentioned before, you know, I think the idea of putting the house on the on, on Airbnb right now would be a little bit premature. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, I, no, I, and I wouldn't. And this is the uh, the other challenge, too, is this is part of the reason why I haven't allowed other tenants to move in. She had one that moved out, um, you know, mid-March and. Mm -hmm. Again, I mean, be, between Harvard Medical School and some of the other areas in there, it's very easy to rent. Um, but it, and how I see it is that, again, the house needs work. And I don't feel comfortable just allowing people to move in when certain things need to be done. Okay. You know? So, I, I, like I said, that this is really where I, I think the more that finding out exactly what needs to be done, you know, uh, cost wise. Um, again, the option of her moving back home is not an option. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's not like she's in assisted living and then all of a sudden we can't do something and then she's going to have to go back home. So again, there's a, a lot of, I don't mean undue pressure. I mean, I, again, I'm not being forced to do any of this, but at the end of the day, it's also her decision, you know, that, that she is still the owner of this home. Um, I have no, you know, legal rights to, to step in and do anything in, in her situation. So I've been, like I said, just at this point, trying to gather as much information to make the most educated financial decision that I can to, like I said, I, I can't sink myself, you know, and so it's not necessarily where I can step in and just kind of write a check for, for everything that's going on. Right. But so, so at this point, I, I think everything boils down to what 12 years of evolution for life cycle has, has brought us to is that clients feel a lot more comfortable when they have information in front of them to make a decision, which is why we do the evaluation assessment, which is why we're in the evaluating process so that we can arm you with the information that you can be able to muster all the information in one, the, the, the numbers, the facts, the condition of the property, so that you can make an informed decision. And I think having that information in front of you was gonna, is gonna make a, a world of difference from your perspective to be able to influence your, your aunt in the right direction. Would you agree? Yeah, I know, absolutely. I mean, without a doubt that, that you know, the, the more information and, pieces of the puzzle that we can put together, it, you know, will give us the options of being able to really kind of realistically look at what is the next step. So I think we know exactly what the next steps is on our end. We got all that. We got two days of, uh, of putting information together from the, the calculations with the, the, the roof square footage, dimensions, measurements. You know, we also looked at a lot of the work that the previous contractor had done that wasn't done correctly, that needs to be done entirely over. 
Um, and I think once we're done with giving you all the information, I think you're going to feel a lot more confident to have that final discussion with your aunt. Like you said, you can't make the final decision for her, but I do feel that once we give you this information and you can give it to her, you're going to feel like you can take a step back and say, look, the ball is in your court. You make a decision. You let you let me know what you want to do, but I can't go any further because you've been given enough information to be felt to feel comfortable making that choice. Would you agree? No, absolutely. And I'm not saying that I don't have any, you know, kind of pull. I don't need pull. It. It's not the right word, but uh, that I don't have uh, kind of a say at, at this point, too. It, it, again, I think that there's this delicate line of of being respectful, mm-hmm. but also being realistic. Um, and I, I think that there's a lineage and a history that also needs to be recognized, too. In 1902, people of color did not have an opportunity to buy homes, you know? Mm-hmm. And so when you even look at that historical fact, that um, especially in the Boston area back then, that there's a, there's a lot of pride there as well. No, totally. I mean, there's a lot of pride in owning a home and, and working hard to finally pay it off. But then there's a lot of responsibility and obligation to have a home that's been handed to you and through generation from generation and feel like you don't want to be the generation to to drop the ball. I don't think that she's necessarily guilty of that, um, but we definitely don't want her to fall victim of that. Right. Um, so I think getting you all this information so that you guys can talk collectively as a family and, and make the right decision, I think is the right direction to take at this point. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow back up with you in the next couple of days once we get all the numbers and everything together, and we're going to give you an evaluation assessment. In that assessment, you're going to have all the questions that you need, and we're going to have another conversation, and we're going to hopefully nail down uh, a, a direction that I think you, your aunt, and any other individuals in your family is going to feel comfortable with pursuing. Sounds good? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, like I said, I appreciate your like I said, it's a, a little bit harder and more challenging, uh, only for the fact that I'm 3,000 miles away. And like I said, I have to rely on kind of blind trust in some ways. And uh, like I said, you came highly recommended, which is always an added bonus for, you know, comfort level. So uh, like I said, I, I look forward to kind of taking the next steps and figuring out where we're at and using your guidance as well. Great. Thank you so much. And I like to Thank you for being a guest on the show. This is another episode of The Transition Expert. As you can see from our guest, she you know she has an aunt that she's looking to make some decisions. And there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. But I mean, it's coming from a loving place. I can tell by talking to you and engaging that you really do love your aunt and you really do want to do what's best for her. I don't get the impression that this is someone who's just looking at the, the money grab and the real estate opportunity. This is these are real tough, tough decisions to make, and you're you're making them. And, and and I encourage you and the family all the many blessings that you're going to need and require to to make the the long journey ahead. So I'm going to be there with you. We're going to help you. We're going to assist you. Stay tuned uh, to another episode of the Transition Expert. All right, Brendan. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Bye.